Welcome to this screencast of our session Ahadada Visualization with our Studio and ggplot2. It's an introduction to this particular package, ggplot2, used for data visualization in the R programming language. So it's one of the most popular packages around in the R ecosystem and we'll have a look at a few essentials to get you started in this session. So what are we going to have a look at? Here's a little list of objectives have a visualization package installed, ggplot2, on your computer. We'll learn how to quickly have a look at our data, also, although we've had a look at that in the first introductory session. We'll learn about the basics of ggplot2 visualizations, uh, which include three essential elements we'll go over again and again. We'll use different kinds of visualization, or geometries as they're called in this package, ggplot2, We'll learn how we can several, um, sorry, layer several visualizations together. And we'll also learn how we can amend colors, labels, themes, and coordinates. So quite a bit to look through. So let's get started. You should have R and RStudio installed. I'm gonna open RStudio now. And a little bit of setting up that we need to do straight away as always is create an R project to have everything contained. So I'm going to go to the right hand side here, there's a drop down menu, the projects menu, and I can go to new projects here. We'll do a brand new directory and a brand new project. So the two top two choices here. And here I'm going to save my project as a subdirectory of my R projects directory. We can name this one RStudio underscore ggplot2 underscore intro, for example. You can name it whatever you want. This is going to be the name of your project or your directory. And it's going to be created as a subdirectory of this directory. Once you're happy with those details, we can click Create Project. And this starts a new R session. We've got an empty environment. And in our files pane, you can see that we've got only one file, the rproj file. I might zoom in a little bit, make sure that you can see everything. Another bit of setting up that we'll do straight away is install the package ggplot2. So you can do that with the packages pane here. As you can see, I already have the package here, so I won't go through the install process. It may take a while. You can use this install button here to open this dialog and start searching for the ggplot2 package. So you can click install and that will run the command install.packages with the argument ggplot2. So the other way to do that, you can go straight to your console, install the packages ggplot2 as a string, and this will fetch it from the official CRAN repositories. And this should take a few seconds, although ggplot2 requires quite a few other packages to function. It has what we call dependencies, so it might take longer than other smaller packages. So make sure you execute that and double check that you've got ggplot2 listed in your packages after that when it's finished. You can also, if it doesn't appear there, refresh the package listing that might help to bring it up. First step in our setting up is creating a new script. You can do that with the new file menu, the drop down here, top left. And the top choice here is a new R script. This opens your source pane and we can introduce our script with a couple of comments. The description can be intro to ggplot2 visualizations.
and make sure you save your script. You can use this floppy disk icon or the shortcut Control S. I'm going to name this one process. And when I press Enter, confirm, notice that automatically our studio adds a dot capital R to your name, to your file name, and that's for an R script. So the R package ggplot2 was developed by Hadley Wickham with the objective of creating a grammar of graphics for categorical data. That was back in 2007. It is based on a book that first came out, I believe, in 1999 by Leland Wilkinson called The Grammar of Graphics. So the GG in ggplot2 is for grammar of graphics. Once we've got our package installed, we can load it with the library function. Here we don't need the double quotes. ggplot2 and execute that with Control enter remember the shortcut, to execute from script, Control plus enter. You can see that the command was executed in my console. We've got ggplot2 loaded and some details about what kind of methods have been overwritten by the package, which is not particularly important for our purpose today. Okay, so there's quite a few components to ggplot2 visualizations. It might start, as you look at them, being a bit overwhelming as you first approach the package, because you can create data visualizations with ggplot2 playing around with data, aesthetic mappings, geometric objects, scales, faceting, position, statistical transformations, a coordinate system, and themes. So there's quite a lot to play around with, which makes the package a very customizable option to create visualizations. But we can start simple and focus on the most essential elements, three essential elements. And with a shortcut function called qplot. So this qplot function comes with ggplot2 and can be used straight away to kind of copy the original syntax uh, of uh, our data visualization. So using the base R graphics, you might be familiar with how they work. So using qplot shouldn't be too new to you. So I'm starting with the name of the function qplot and as arguments I'm going to use three separate arguments. First, where the data comes from. And today we're going to have a look at data sets that are already available in the packages that we have loaded. So some of them will come from base R, others will come from ggplot2. So data is the argument where that defines where the data comes from. msleep is the data set. So if I look at msleep, I can print it to screen in the console and you see that it's a table that contains data about mammals and there's quite a bit of inf information in there but if you want more details you can use question mark msleep and see the help page for this particular data set. So the help pages are not only for functions they're also for data sets. msleep ggplot2 that means it is part of the package ggplot2 and it's an updated and expanded version of the mammals sleep data set. If you scroll to format you'll see the names of the different variables that are available in there and what we'll do today is a simple bar chart of a count of how many times each conservation status comes up in the data set. So we've defined where the data comes from msleep it's straight away available once you load ggplot2. The second argument after a comma will be conservation that we associate to the x-axis and we call this an aesthetic in ggplot2 so the x-axis is one of the aesthetics that are available 
and we associate to it a variable from our dataset. Finally, third essential element today is the geometry. And we'll use the argument geom and assign the value bar to it. B-A-R for a bar chart. And we can execute this and hopefully get a visualization. So in your plots pane, plots tab that automatically opens, you can see our visualization. It's called, oh well, it doesn't have a title right now, but we've got, as we defined it, conservation on the x-axis, a count on the y-axis that was automatically applied, and we can see the labels for each conservation status on the x-axis, including least concern, uh, vulnerable, not applicable, domesticated, endangered, etc. So you can see that the first category is NA, the most common, but, we'll, but the following one is least concern. So the automatic stat that is applied to our data when we use Qplot is the count stat. So that's what we've got on our y-axis. We didn't have to define what the y-axis is associated to because automatically a bar chart in ggplot2 will apply a count stat. So we've got our three essential elements here. Where the data comes from, second, the mapping of our aesthetics, like some more space here, and finally, the geometry. So the geometrical elements that we'll use to represent the data. You'll always have to make sure that you've got the th those three essential elements when you create a ggplot2 visualization. So let's move on to a different geometry, a point geometry, which will create a scatter plot. So we'll change our data. The data is called economics. So it's economical data from the US. It's a time series. And we will apply the full ggplot2 syntax from now on. So we use a very short version here with qplot but it will be a lot more flexible once you start using the full ggplot2 syntax. So we'll go through the three essential elements again, but know that from now on we'll use this syntax because it's the most common you'll see. So let's start with the ggplot function. Now notice there's no two in there. ggplot without the two will be able to set up a few defaults in there. So first, just as we did before, data is coming from economics. And following argument is mapping, the mapping of aesthetics. And what we provide to this mapping argument is the AES function for aesthetic, which can contain all the mapping of aesthetics. So it's a way to group all of those together. So you can see that it comes with a pop-up or a little tooltip there that says the AES function can take X, Y, and more. So that's where we define our aesthetics and how we map them to variables. Let's have a look at economics. I'm going to click on the name economics and press F1 on my keyboard. The F1 key will open the help page on the right here. So it's a US economic time series, as I said. And if you scroll to format, you can see that it's got 478 rows and six variables. There's a date and there's then a number of fairly confusing variable names, but what we want to know now is the number of unemployed people in thousands, this one here, and use on the x-axis the date. So what we want to visualize is how the number of unemployed people has evolved throughout the years. Okay, so in the AES function, uh, 
I am going to define, I can go back to the help page here to have a look at the variable names. First, on the x-axis, we want to use date. And on the y-axis, we want to use an employee. So we've set up a few defaults here. We can execute this, it's a valid command. But notice that we can't see anything on our uh, on our plot, nothing represented there. We can see that the assignment of variables to aesthetic elements has worked as expected. Date on the x-axis, an employee on the y-axis. But we've got nothing on this area. So I'm going to go plus after this ggplot statement and then use a geometry function. And they all start with geom underscore. If you start typing geom underscore, you'll see a selection of different geometries that are available in ggplot2. But the one we're going to go with is point. We don't need to specify any arguments in there. We can use it as it is, but make sure you've got that plus sign that specifies to R that this whole thing is one single command. So if I execute this now, I should see this scatter plot with one point for each row of data that represents the increase or the changes in the number in the number of unemployed people in thousands over the years. So roughly between 1965 and 2015. So you can notice a few things here, especially the biggest peak around 2010 after the global financial crisis. And we can go through again our three essential elements, where the data comes from, the mapping of aesthetic elements to variables, and finally, the geometry. Let's move on to another scatter plot, but with a different data set. This data set is called MPG, and it stands for miles per gallon. Oops, there we go. So again, let's start with ggplot. Define where our data comes from, so data equals mpg. Mapping takes the aes function. I'll open the parenthesis here and I'm going to have a look again at the help page for this particular data set. Fuel economy data from 1999 and 2008 for 38 popular models of cars. Under format we can see that there's data about displacement which is the size of the engine or engine displacement in litres and we've got HWY, which is highway miles per gallon. So our question here is, is a bigger engine more fuel efficient? So let's have a look at that. On the x-axis we want DISPL, and on the y-axis we want highway. Now we need to decide on a geometry and we're going to stick to the one we had before, geom underscore point. So we can see our scatter plot here in the plots pane. And it seems like there is a negative relationship between engine size on the x axis and fuel efficiency on the y-axis. It looks like there's a downward trend here with maybe a few outliers. So this area here we might want to even investigate a bit more. What's happening there? So it looks like the bigger the engine, the less fuel efficient. But let's investigate that a bit more. So far we've used the x-axis and y-axis, but there's many aesthetics available depending on the geometry that we use. So here we'll use an extra variable well, an extra variable associated to an extra aesthetic element. So color is an aesthetic that we can use with many geometries. And we'll associate this to class. If I go back to my help page, you can see that class at the bottom 
is the type of car. So that might show us a bit more information about our data set and about this downwards, downward trend. Let's execute that again with our extra aesthetic and variable. And now we can see some color on our points and a key or legend to the right of the plot that shows us for each class value, for each type of car, the color that's associated to it. So we can see now in this little cloud to the right that those outliers are mostly related to one class of car, which is the two-seater. So this might explain a bit more why there is this downward trend in general. So bigger engine, less fuel efficient. So we've got a group of cars here that is a bit more fuel efficient than others, but still have big engines and it probably is because bigger cars have bigger engines. So the bigger the engine, often you'll have more weight to displace. So maybe the main factor as we're exploring this data is the weight of the car that will make the car less fuel efficient. So this is how you add extra variables to your visualization. Now we're visualizing three variables at the same time. Let's have a look at trend lines because we're talking about trends. So trend lines can be created with another geometry. Let's start again with ggplot, where our data comes from MPG, same data set as before, and the mapping of aesthetics is as follows. On the x-axis we want disp, and on the y-axis is highway. This is the exact same base as before plus sign after this and we'll stick, oh no, actually we're changing the geometry to GM smooth. Execute this and we can see our trend line in our plot area. A couple of things here. In our console there's a bit of a message that's letting us know that GM smooth is using a method called, called LUS and a formula Y according to X. So this is useful information because there's many ways to draw trend lines or smoothers on a plot. So ggplot2 and specifically geomsmooth does a bit of automatic work to determine what method is useful for what data. Let's have a look at the help page here. I'm clicking on geomsmooth and then using the F1 key on my keyboard brings up the help page for this particular function. Geomsmooth is here. And we're interested in the method that was used. You can see that the argument method is set to auto by default. And we can go to the arguments section under method to understand better what's happening there. So it says that the smoothing method or function to, you, to use is by default auto. You can see it here. The smoothing method is chosen based on the size of the largest group across all panels. So LUS is used for less than 1000 observations, which is our case. We've got a data set with less than 1000 rows. Otherwise, with the auto method, GMSmooth will switch to a different formula and different function to calculate this trend line. So this is important information. Know also that you can change your method to something else if you want. There's a few functions that are easy to use. A few methods that are easy to use. You only have to specify the name here. So if you want a trend line that's straight, if you want to apply a linear model to it, to your data, you can use LM. And we can demonstrate that by going to our code and changing the default method argument or value to LM. If I execute this, I can now see a straight tra uh, trend line on our data. But what if we want, also, we want to also represent the dots on our plot? Often the visualizations that you see are the dots and on top of it a trend line. So what we can do is add an extra line here and use geom point again and don't forget the plus afterwards. So now we've got three functions here 
separated by plus, plus signs. ggplot for a few defaults and two geometries stacked on top of each other. So notice that the last one will be drawn on top of the points. So smoother is drawn on top of the points. That's usually what you want. And we've got our two visualizations on one single plot. So what if we want to add again our color aesthetic? So we're doing trend lines here and layering. But what if we want to add colors? So we could go back to our aesthetic call, but what I'm going to do here is go to GM point and use the mapping argument locally and use the S function, AES function with color equals class. So this is what we want. We want points colored according to the class variable. Now notice that I've used it in the geom point function rather than adding it inside the ggplot call. And there's a good reason for that because here in ggplot we're defining a few defaults that will be used by the following functions. So imagine that I didn't have this local setting and I added the aesthetic color in my ggplot function. If I execute that, I'll have different colors for all my points and also for all my smooth lines. So remember that what you define here in the ggplot call will be used by all other geometries, by all the geometries that are following unless you override those settings inside them. So you can understand that if you're going to use X and Y exactly the same in all the geometries, it's good to define them in ggplot. But if you want to apply one single mapping of aesthetic to one single geometry, it's better to go to the actual geometry function. So that's why we set it inside the geom point function. So we're pretty happy with this one. If you like the look of it, you can already save this visualization with the export menu. So there's a few things in there. One easy one is copy to clipboard. If you're creating a document or a presentation, you can straight away copy and paste that. One good choice is saving as a PDF because it is um, vector graphic and it always looks good as you zoom in. So here you can define the file name. I'm going to call this fuel efficiency. And by default, you will save it inside my working directory or my project directory. So you can set the size here and what orientation you want it as. I'm going to go click Save. And if you go to your files now, you should see a new PDF. Here it is, fuelefficiency.pdf. If I click on that, it will open with my default PDF viewer. And you can see that it is a vector graphic that doesn't show any pixels as I zoom in. Now another option, back to my plots pane here, is to use the save as image. And here you'll have more choices for formats. So there's those image, image formats that you might want to use. PNG is a raster format, so you'll see pixel, pixels there just like JPEG. If you're using, if you're saving graphics like those ones, you probably want to save it, save them in PNG. It's more optimized. If you want to manipulate your visualizations later on with another program with a vector um, editing program you can use SVG. So if you want to do further modifications, SVG is probably a good choice. Again, decide on the name here. I'm going to reuse the same one. This one will be called Fuel Efficiency. It will have a different extension name, PNG. And I can play around with this 
area to change the size of my plot and know that the code is rerun so it always looks good. Right. And I can click Save and again by default in my working directory I can see fuelefficiency.png, I can open that and see what it looks like. So it's a pretty small size but if I zoom in you'll see that you start seeing the pixels. That's because it's a raster format. Okay, let's move on to economics again. We're going to apply a very similar visualization to our economics data. So let's do ggplot with the data argument associated to economics, the mapping argument with the AES function that groups the X aesthetic associated to date, the date variable, and the Y aesthetic associated to unemploy. Geom underscore point is our first geometry, but here we're going to define again some color for our points. So we define them, lo them locally in the geom point call because we, want, we don't want that to be applied to the smoothers. And what I'm using here as a variable, my third variable, is umpmed which if you look at the help page for economics is defined as the median duration of unemployment in weeks. So this is important information we might want to visualize how many people are unemployed but also how long for. So umpmed is the variable and I'm adding a plus after that for our geom smooth. Smooth, there we go. So hopefully I typed everything right. Control enter to execute the whole thing and now we've got our smoother. By default again, as you can see in the console, the method loose is used and it goes through our data. Now you can see the color. The color scale in our legend looks different to before because now we're using a continuous variable. We're using numbers here, whereas before we had classes of cars, a categorical variable. So different color scale here that's used. And you can see on our plot that people were unemployed for longer, especially right after the global financial crisis. So we've added extra interesting information to our visualization. Again, you can export that if you like this one. Save it as PDF. And let's call this one Unemployment US. Save. So back to files, here it is, Unemployment US. If you're happy with it, there it is. Let's have a look at bar charts again, because they're a good example to introduce another aesthetic that we haven't had a look at just yet. So bar charts with diamonds data set. Again you can find information about the data set with question mark diamonds. Again a data set that's included in ggplot2. It's the price of 50,000 round cut diamonds. So a bigger data set here. It's got 53,940 rows. And it's got 10 variables, quite a few different variables for our diamonds. Some of them don't really make sense to me, but uh, for example, carat, which is the weight of the diamond. So let's have a look at the quality of the cut. There's a cut variable here and it goes from fair to ideal. So we want to visualize how distributed between the different categories the data set is. So let's start with ggplot. And here I'm going to start omitting argument names. As you know, if you use arguments in order, if you really know your functions, you can start only providing 
the values to your arguments. You don't need to name the arguments. So let's go straight to diamonds as the data set. Then mapping of aesthetics is as follows. Sorry, I'm saying that we should omit the names. So I'll go straight to AES. And X is associated to cut. This saves us a little bit of typing. And then I'm going to go to geom bar. This is our bar geometry function. So not much code here for a bar geometry. You can see that the cut variable is an ordered factor. So we know that fair is not as good as good and not as good as very good and not as good as premium and not as good as ideal. Ideal is the top one. So that there is an order here which ggplot2 respects. It uses the same order to place labels on the x-axis. And as I said before, the automatic stat applied to the data on the y-axis is a count how many times this category comes up in the data set. So there's our default geom bar. Now let's add some more information with an extra aesthetic. So we want to visualize a second variable and it's going to be called fill. And we want to fill with the clarity of the variables, sorry, of the diamonds. I can execute that. And now we've got boxes on our bar chart and a legend to the side telling us what the colors correspond to. So it's different levels of clarity. Again, I think they are ordered there. And now we can see how in each cut category, how the, this clarity is partitioned. Now notice that I used fill and not color. And I'll demonstrate what color does. If you've got an area on your plot, color will color the outline of the area, whereas fill will color the whole area. So I assume you th also think that fill is a better choice here for a bar chart. So you might want to stick to this one. So there's our fourth aesthetic for the day. We've seen X, Y, color, and now we have a look at fill. So those are very common ones. Now let's see something about theming. So back to our original bar chart. We're still working with diamonds. We still want X to be associated to cut, quality of the cut. And we still want the bar geometry. But here I'm going to change it slightly. I'm going to go to the bar geometry and say that the fill has to be tomato. So tomato is one of the R colors. There's a few hundred colors in R that have names that you can straight away use, but you can also use hex values if you want to be specific about the color that you want to use. What I'm doing here, you notice that this is not included inside an aesthetic call because I am not specifying a mapping of aesthetic to a variable. I'm actually theming my whole geometry, geom bar, to be to have the color tomato instead of the default gray. So I don't need to include that in AES because that's only for associating an aesthetic element to a variable from my data set. So this is how you change the look of your of your visualization. Other things you might want to do in theming is changing the labels. You can use the function labs, which groups quite a few labels in there. You can assign a title, which is not necessarily a great idea. You might want to keep the title for your publication, but it can be useful. For example, where are the bad ones? And I can give better labels for my axes. So for X, I'm going to say quality of the cut. And Y is number of diamonds. Notice that I'm using double quotes here to surround my strings. 
and here's our new labels. Where are the bad ones at the top? Number of diamonds on the x on the y axis and quality of the cut on the y axis. I might change this to a capital for consistency. Here we go. Now let's do some more customizing. Often what you need to do with a bar chart, especially if you've got on the x-axis labels that are very long and start overlapping, you might want to use this really handy little function called chord flip. This is our first coordinate modifier and it's designed to quickly flip your x and y axes. So if I execute this code, don't, don't forget the plus here, I end up with a flipped visualization with the x-axis on um, instead of the y and the y and instead of the x. So they are still identified as x and y, they keep the same name, but the coordinates have changed. This is particularly handy for long labels here. So horizontal bar chart here. We're doing more than theming here. It's theming, labeling, and coordinates. And now before you get into the theme function, which might be overwhelming, I'll show you what it looks like. I'm going to look at the help page for the theme function. And here's a really long list of arguments that you can use for the theme function. So this shows you that there's a lot of customization you can do for your visualization, but it is overwhelming. So that's why there's a few theme functions that are built in to offer you some nice little defaults. So for example, theme underscore black and white will change the default gray look of a ggplot2 visualization to something that's more suited for black and white print for example or that's a little bit more minimal but actually there's also theme underscore minimal here it is which really strips down the stuff that you might not want so try those built-in theme functions. If you start typing theme underscore, you'll see that there's a few that you can try. Theme black and white, theme dark, theme gray, theme light, etc, etc, line draw. So give them a go, see if they work for you, and then if you want to further modify, you can go into the theme function. So I'll stick to minimal here, happy with that. And I'm gonna go to export and save as an image. I'm going to stick to PNG here and I'm going to call this one horizontal horiz bar and save. And if I go to files, there's our third plot, horiz bar. I can open that and have a look at it. If you don't want to use the graphical user interface and you might want to have extra little options, you can use a command to save your latest plot. So that's part of ggplot. You can save a plot with a command. So let's do ggsave and the only thing that we need to supply is where we save it. So I'm going to go file name equals horiz underscore bar.pdf and you can define straight away what kind of format you want here in the name. So if I save this it tells me in the console saving 6.35 by 5.67 inches image, that's the default unit here and you can see horiz bar.pdf is included here. There we go, vector graphic What's good about ggsave is that you can include it in a script and automate the process, but also if you look at the help page, you'll see that it has a few arguments that you can make use of. 
including an argument called DPI, and that's dots per inches, and it gives you the definition of your plot that you save. So if I go to DPI, it goes, it says plot resolution, and it accepts some strings too. So if you know what you want to do with your plot, you can go, actually I want the DPIs to be suited to a print. So this is gonna be a higher DPI than for a screen. And you might have a different size there. So remember that. Actually, I'm not sure that for PDF it makes so much sense, but if I were to do that for a PNG, I could save that as a PNG. I've got Horace bar here, that PNG, 55.2 kilobytes. If I did the same thing, but for Horace bar screen, and change the DPIs to screen. I end up with Horace bar screen here, which is a way smaller size. You can see 5.4 kilobytes, about 10% of the other one. And you can see that the definition is way smaller, or the resolution. But that's it for today's session. As always, there are notes for today's session online. They're all publicly available, released under a Creative Commons license, so you can reuse them. And the link is under the video in the description. So you'll have access to all those notes with all the details. If you wanna go through the material again, there's the visualizations. If you miss something, it's a good spot to start. There is also at the end of the material a bunch of links that we recommend you to have a look at. So specific to ggplot2, there's a bunch of them um, that we've put together, but also in general for R, you can follow this link at the bottom that takes you to even more resources. And that's links that we've compiled over the last few months that we think are very relevant and um, very useful resources all categorized there. So don't hesitate to go through this. There is also a second session on ggplot2 to learn a bit more about that package. Again, we don't go through the whole thing because there's a lot to see. And if you go to RStudio, you can access the help menu up here and the cheat sheets menu here that shows you a bunch of cheat sheets from RStudio. You can go to the website at the bottom here, but straight away you can access data visualization with ggplot2. It's a really good printout to have a PDF that you can download from our studio straight away. It takes you to your browser, it downloads this, and you can see an overview of all the functions that are included in ggplot2. So we've seen a few of them, but there's a lot more. But it's got those little pictograms that really help you understand what each function does and it's classified between the different geometries that you can use and how to modify stats, scales, position, coordinates, faceting, labels, legends, and themes. So have a look through that. It's a really good document. And make sure you save your script before you leave your project. Now when I close my R Studio. You will ask me if I want to save my workspace image. That's all your data inside your environment. We didn't do much in there, so I'll, I'm going to click Don't Save. Thanks for watching today's session. Thanks for watching this screencast. Hopefully it was helpful, and don't hesitate to ask us questions too. Cheers.